Hi friends, I'm Jeff E.G. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I hope the content will answer your questions and may inspire you. In this video, I'm going to talk about good vocal recordings. I'm going to walk through all the elements from microphones and audio interfaces to outboard gear, plugins, and even the DAW that you use. But I'm also going to cover some important concepts about what it takes to get a good vocal recording. Things that go beyond the technology and the gear, but how to inspire the performance and capture that performance digitally that's going to make your song unique and successful. And I'm going to get straight to the point with practical information. Rather than do a deep dive into the technology and enter the debate about what's good and what's bad, I'm just going to tell you in practical terms what you need to buy, how you need to set it up, and how to get good results. Let's run through just some of the basics quickly on what you need to get your vocals into a digital format. You're going to need a microphone, an audio interface, and a digital audio workstation or DAW software. An alternative is you could buy a USB microphone, in which case the audio interface is built right into the microphone and you can plug it directly into your laptop or desktop computer. Once you have all the equipment set up, you'll be adjusting the input gain, which is how loud the signal is coming into your software for recording purposes. To do that, there's usually a knob on the audio interface that you adjust, and you're going to be singing or talking into the microphone while you attempt to find the peak level of volume from the microphone. Now, professional recording engineers will tell you to target a level of minus six to minus 12 dB. And that's to leave sufficient room for post-production processing where you're gonna add effects and other things that might increase the volume of that signal later. That space, let's call that headroom. When you're adjusting the input gain, there's probably LED lights on the audio interface. They're usually green, yellow, and red. If they're going into the red, that means your signal is too loud and you've turned up the gain too far. That causes clipping, and that's what we want to avoid. To get more accuracy, within your DAW, you can also open metering, and the metering will give you specific values instead of just these lights. The goal is to turn up the gain so that it's hot enough to capture all the essence of the performance the breathing, the delivery, the saturation, but not so hot that it distorts. We want good, clean signals without distortion. After you've captured a good digital recording, you might want to apply pitch correction, a de-esser, a limiter, some reverb, and other effects that are going to improve the way your vocals sound. There are lots of common post-production techniques that have been in use for years. When you do these test recordings, you're going to be able to see the audio file inside your DAW. And you'll see that low volume audio files have very little amplitude, whereas large files have more amplitude. By looking at those waveforms, you can get a sense of the quality of the recording. Some audio interfaces, like the Audion Evo 4, or actually most of the Evo series, have a feature that automatically adjusts the gain based on you singing or talking into a microphone for a few minutes, it makes the adjustments and takes the guesswork out of that process for you. The loudness of a vocalist's voice can vary greatly. And that's why it's not unusual to have multiple tracks with different takes. You might find the vocalist sings the chorus really loud and the verse is very quiet. So you wanna record those things separately and make adjustments to the input gain to try and get a more consistent level of volume. You'll find a lot of videos on YouTube that talk about compressors, the pros and cons, and how they work. But for the purposes of this video, I'll just tell you that a compressor levels out the loud parts and increases the quiet parts to a more consistent volume throughout the entire take. That's the purpose of a compressor. In all of the vocal recordings that we're gonna talk about, we're gonna use a compressor. This is not a vocal isolation booth. In fact, it's the opposite of what you want to record good vocals. And yet, we have to acknowledge that many singers will tell you that the best performance that they ever have is in the shower. Let's look at the reasons why that occurs. First of all, 
there's this notion that nobody's paying any attention to what you're doing when you're in the shower. So you tend to sing out freely without any restrictions. It's this liberated, unrestricted vocal style that really shines when you're hiding in the shower. The second thing is all of these hard surfaces in here create tons of reverb, the exact opposite of what you want for a good vocal recording. But for most of us, that reverb provides feedback to our brains that helps us both sing in tune and we can hear all those subtle elements of our voice and make adjustments quickly, which result in an exceptional performance. The third thing might be that we just sing better in the nude. So if you want to record in the shower, go ahead and do it. The lesson about singing in the shower is that we want to recreate in the studio the same conditions that enable a singer to give their peak performance whether it's how comfortable they are or the reverb and feedback that they're getting through their headphones. We want to be able to do that, but in a studio setting where we've applied acoustic treatment to minimize the amount of outside noise and reverberation that might impact our recording. If you have the budget to buy acoustic panels and bass traps and all of the equipment to deaden that room, that's great. And if you don't have the budget, then you need some thick curtains and some mattresses and things that you can set up to create a quasi vocal booth. Something to be aware of is that microphones all come with different cardioid patterns, which is the area with which they pick up the sound. Some microphones, particularly condenser microphones, are actually recording information not just from the front, but from the sides. And that gives the recording quite a bit more dynamics. Some people want that dynamic and some don't. And if you don't, you need to put up some kind of a barrier or shield behind a condenser microphone so that the only sound it's recording is from the front. Let's quickly talk about microphones. In my mind, there are different categories of microphones and it's debatable how much difference they make. But for $100 at the low end, you can get a Shure SM57 or SM58. You can even get an AT2020 which is a condenser microphone. Here's a group of good microphones in the $100 range. There's a few to choose from here, but two of the ones that I like quite a bit are the Shure SM58 and the Audio-Technica AT2020. Another new one for me in this range is the Neat Worker B, the King B2. Yes, the Shure mics are dynamic microphones with a limited cardioid pattern that is designed for live, but they work equally well in the studio. There are some other cheaper microphones in the $50 range, and I'd say stay away from them. I tried one myself, and to be honest, it was a piece of crap. There was something loose inside the microphone that had like a rattling tinny sound, and every time I recorded a vocal with it, no matter how hard I tried, I could still hear that rattle. The next tier is really large condenser microphones in the budget range. In the next tier, tier two, these are mostly large diaphragm condenser mics. There's lots of different ones to choose from, and you'll notice that the Shure SM7B, which has been kind of a standard, has some competitors that look very similar, like the Universal Audio SD1 and the Earthworks Ethos. A few that I quite like in this category are the Rode NT1, and there is some ribbon mics in this category. Of them, I like the Royer R10. There are many different ones in here, and if you go to YouTube to look for, the, you know, what's the best microphone in that category, you'll get a lot of passionate opinions about one being better than the other. But in my opinion, they all sound basically the same. They have some slight different characteristics. Some have more highs and more lows, but you can compensate for those things with a few plugins and effects. So at the end of the day, they all sound pretty much the same. The next tier would really be microphones in the $1,000 to $1,500 range. You've got some classics like the Newman TLM 103. And remember, in this category, there are microphones that are replicas of classic vintage microphones. So you've got 
say, warm audio with their version of a U47 tube mic. You've got the Loughton Audio mics, which are excellent quality copies of the AKG C414. Two of the microphones I like in this category are the Palusa P414, which is a tube mic, and the Loughton Audio Clarion FC357. In that range, you generally get a little bit better quality. These microphones are typically smoother sounding. And if you spend towards the top end of that $1,500, you're into some handmade limited supply microphones that emulate classic vintage microphones from the old days that might cost $5,000 or $8,000. So for a relatively small price, you're getting vintage quality. Now the top microphones can be anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000. Does that come into play? Well, not really. Finally, in the category of expensive mics over $3,000, I just highlighted a few here because most of these are beyond the budget of your average recording studio or home studio. These range anywhere from $3,000 up to over $10,000 for the Sony C800G. Those microphones are reserved for high-end studios and the top artists and bands that are out there that are willing to pay for that. If you have a vocalist that you want to record with that type of gear, my recommendation would be to either rent the microphones and preamps you need or just go into a professional studio pay the hourly rate and get the advantages of the professional engineer that's working there. One last category that often comes up is USB microphones versus the traditional XLR type microphones. And there are some very good USB microphones out there, but you're limiting yourself to the preamp that's built into the mic, which might be good enough, but maybe not as good as an audio interface. There are lots of different microphone types. There's large, medium, and small condenser microphones. There's ribbon microphones and tube microphones. A lot of them requiring 48 volt phantom power. That's not too unusual. But for the purposes of this video, I'm not gonna do a deep dive into the pros and cons of each one. There's lots of other videos out there that will answer those questions for you. I think it's practical for most of us to target one of those budget large condenser microphones in the $200 to $400 range. That's going to bring you the best value for your investment and it's something that you can use every day. Think of it as your daily driver. I want to introduce you to another concept that you need to think about. If Adele or Mariah Carey or Josh Groban walked into your studio, we might agree that we need $100,000 worth of high-end recording equipment. And that's because they have unique and rare characteristic voices. But these singers are exceptional, and they sing in a classic, almost opera-like style. They have incredible tone, breath control. Some of them have a four or five octave range, but that's probably not what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have to ask yourself, how much benefit does the average vocalist derive from $100,000 worth of recording equipment. And I'd say, not very much. Do you need a $10,000 vintage microphone? Do you need a $5,000 preamp? No. There's another level of recording that I would call good enough. Remember that all of the technology that's available today is exceptional, even at budget prices. In fact, the quality of the vocal recording is only going to be a small element in the success of the song overall. There are other elements, even in the vocal performance, around style and delivery that are going to matter more. We need to change our way of thinking from the pursuit of the ultimate vocal recording to something that's good quality and good enough. Several years ago, Michael Jackson released a multi-track of a song called Scream. It was kind of positioned as a contest for producers to go in and mix the 20 or 25 tracks in a unique way. But what was really interesting about it is that you could isolate Michael Jackson's vocals. I, so what does it mean, Daddy? We kicked me down. I got to get up. Check that it sounds. The whole system sucks, Daddy. Big in the shadow, a command of the light. 
And if you pay close attention to it, you might say, wow, all those yells and screams and pops and extra sounds that he adds in, they're so stylistic that would it have mattered whether he recorded this in an expensive studio or on budget gear? And I think the answer is, when you have someone who's that unique, that stylistic, it almost doesn't matter. I think we can safely say that regardless of the technology, a vocal line from Michael Jackson is likely to be successful. Back in 2005, Trent Reznor did something similar from Nine Inch Nails. He released The Hand That Feeds, which was off the album with Teeth. Also as a multi-track, not quite as many tracks, but again, you can go in there and isolate the vocals and just listen to Trent Reznor's vocal line. The impression you're left with is, is Trent Reznor recognized as a awesome, unique, and rare talent vocally? No, no, that's not really his strength. It's the entire song, it's the entire effect, it's the performance, it's everything put together. It doesn't matter what equipment was used to record his vocals. No, they have to be good enough, but they don't have to be exceptional. The point of this is that if you're recording a vocalist and you're looking to make good vocals, you're gonna to have to emphasize a lot more on the performance and the elements of that vocal that make it stylistic and unique than the recording quality. It always kills me when I see someone who sings speed metal or a pop punk or hip hop or maybe trance over EDM who goes on and on about spending a fortune on their vocal recording technique and I'm thinking, does the listener really differentiate your music because of the vocal quality? Or is it the style? Is it the music overall? Because some of these genres aren't in the same category as what we were talking about coming from, say, Adele or a Josh Groban or a Mariah Carey. So it's important that you think about what you need to achieve success. When it comes to audio interfaces, I can give you similar practical advice. All of the major vendors provide excellent quality audio interfaces these days. They all support 24-bit resolution and recording sample rates of anywhere from 44.1 kilohertz up to 192 kilohertz. The reality is that most music is being recorded at 44.1 and most broadcast recordings are being done at 48 kilohertz. The likelihood of you using 192 kilohertz is low. First of all, the files will be huge and you may not even like the sound quality being as accurate as it is at that level. The other thing to consider when buying a audio interface is the analog to digital and digital to analog conversion. There's much debate about this on the internet. The more expensive audio interfaces typically have a better chipset and do that process of conversion slightly better. Can you hear the difference though between say a $150 interface and a $1,000 interface? Maybe not. And then the other aspect would be the number of inputs and features that are built into that basic technology. So a two input USB interface is gonna be fairly low cost, but an eight input Thunderbolt 4 interface is gonna be a lot more expensive. It's the same technology, but you're paying for the features. If you go into most professional studios, one of the popular brands that you're gonna see is Universal Audio's Apollo series. One of the reasons it's popular, well, there's a couple reasons why it's popular, but one of the reasons is the analog to digital conversion is quite good. A lot of professionals seem to like it, but another calling card, Apollo has something called Unison preamps built in, and these are modeling preamps that can be altered in terms of their circuitry, sound, and performance to emulate some vintage outboard gear. Today, there's a lot of other vendors that offer the same type of technology as Universal Audio does in that Apollo series. So you really have to look around and check out the prices. There was a point in time where the UA plugins were considered top of the heap and they took advantage of the DSP that was built into the audio interface to offload processing power from your computer to the audio interface. That used to be important, but with new chips like the Apple M1 and M2, that's become less of an issue. The computers are powerful enough now to run those emulations natively. The need to use external DSPs is 
kind of on the decline. <laughs> There's this ongoing debate in the industry. You can't get two producers or recording engineers to agree on whether outboard gear is better than plugins or not. I think generally speaking, people prefer outboard gear. So they'll buy separate preamps, compressors, and EQs. I'll set them up in a rack. You often see this in pictures of a studio. But that equipment has become very expensive lately. And for most people with a home studio or a small commercial studio, it's beyond their budget. The alternative is to buy plugins, which is software that emulates those devices. Now, the plugins have come a really long way in the last five to 10 years. You can buy these plugins at very low cost. There are some major vendors that you know will sell an emulation of an LA-2A or an 1176 compressor for as little as 30 bucks. And it'll run great and it'll sound great. It'll run on your computer within your digital audio workstation. So the debate continues on whether outboard gear is necessary. Let's give those producers the benefit of the doubt and say that the outboard gear does have certain acoustic characteristics and behavior that they like to use in recording good vocals. But for most of us, we can't afford that, so buying plugins is the practical way to go. Universal Audio, for quite a while, has had some of the best plugins, but they were only available to run on their audio interfaces. It's only recently that they have released those same plugins in a native mode so that anybody can buy them. And you can consume them either by buying them outright or on a subscription basis, depending on your needs. My practical advice on the outboard gear versus plugins is that for most of us, the plugins are going to do the trick. But regardless of how much money you spend on the gear that you need to record vocals, none of it guarantees good vocal performance. There are many other elements that come into play that make a vocal performance exceptional, and it isn't based on the technology. And that's because the most talented singers and artists can deliver their peak performance regardless of whether they're singing into a $10,000 microphone or a $500 microphone. And what sets them apart is their style, delivery, and performance. If you had an unlimited budget or you just won the lottery, you could go out and buy the most expensive microphones. You could buy external preamps and compressors and EQ, and you could buy one of the best audio interfaces. And you might end up investing forty dollars or $50,000 in that equipment. But if you're like most people, you're more likely to invest in a budget-priced large diaphragm condenser microphone, a mid-priced audio interface, and use plugins, which are software that, that emulate outboard gear. Will your listeners be able to tell the difference? I don't think so. Let's summarize what we've been discussing. Good vocals depend more on style and performance than the gear. We want to replicate the conditions of singing in the shower. It's ideal to target about 9, negative 9 dB of input gain. Reverb provides feedback to our brains, so it's important to have sufficient reverb in the headphone mix for your vocalist. Use multiple tracks for each song section. Use this as a way to adjust gain compensation between loud and soft parts of a song. Use acoustic treatment to minimize noise. Great recordings can be achieved with mid-price microphones. Similarly, most mid-level audio interfaces are excellent quality. Outboard gear might be great, but plug-in effects can get the job done for a reasonable price. If this kind of content is interesting to you, click on the like button, perhaps subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell for any new videos that I come out with. Thanks for watching this one.